I am very honored this morning to introduce Craig McNamara. Uh, Craig McNamara is a first generation organic walnut grower in Winters, California. He and his wife, Julie, and their three kids operate Sierra Orchards. It's a 250-acre ranch nestled on, the, on Puta Creek, which straddles Solano and Yolo County border. Now, Craig's route to farming would once be considered unconventional, but I'll bet if I had the opportunity to talk with many of you and your journeys, there'd be some certain similarities. Craig spent his youth in Washington, D.C. He's the son of the late former Secretary of Defense, Robert McNamara, and his mom, Margaret McNamara, who once, I hope some of you in the room remember the important literacy program called Reading is Fundamental. His mom founded that program. So while on hiatus from Stanford University, Craig traveled across South America, learning from and working with farmers of many different stripes. And that's where Craig, I understand, developed his passion for agriculture and his passion for lifelong learning. Craig later graduated from UC Davis, and while searching for the best soil for his farming operation, he settled in Winters in 1980. Craig was a very early proponent of sustainable ag practices, forging the way for a productive organic system. In 1995, Craig then founded the Center for Land-Based Learning with a focus on providing opportunities to high school age students from rough and tumble neighborhoods, giving them an opportunity to learn about farming, sustainable agriculture, leadership, environmental restoration, and ultimately connecting with the food system. Craig has been very well recognized for his leadership. Uh, in 2009, Craig was honored by receiving the prestigious Leopold Conserver Conservation Award. He's also won the Governor's Environmental and Economic Leadership Award and also been honored with the UC Davis Award of Distinction for alumni. On top of all that, we are so happy that Craig was recently named president of the California State Board of Food and Agriculture. <clears throat> In that role, he will advise California Department of Food and Ag Secretary Karen Ross and Governor Jerry Brown on agriculture issues writ large. And we certainly look forward to his continued leadership uh, amidst all the challenges we have. Please join me in welcoming Craig McNamara. Good morning, good morning. What a pleasure it is to be here. And Casey, that's the nicest introduction I think I've ever had. So thank you very much. So how's everybody doing? Did you sleep well in those huge beds? I think I might take one home. It might be a great idea. I just want to say a few things about last night. I was able to join you for dinner and for your awards. And um, what incredible leaders and, and visionary people we have with us today, each and every one of you. But I especially wanted to say how much I appreciate and honor the work that Jared and Sabella have done throughout uh, their careers. And what incredible mentors that we have here. They're mentors for me. Um, they're mentors for all of us. So I think that's what we're here to do, is to share um, our stories. And I thought today what I could best do is um, maybe give you a little state of the state of California small and middle-sized farming operations. And I asked Casey before I came down, how do you define a small farm? And uh, I'm not sure I really got a good answer about that. So why don't we begin by looking at um, the statistics. Almost 82,000 farms in California. The average size is 311 acres. I, I read that that went down a little bit over the last few years. And what I find most interesting is the definition that USDA has for, um, for what a farm is. And that's any place from which $1,000 or more of agricultural produce were produced. 
so if you look at the stats, just a little bit less than 50% of all of our 82,000 farms fall in that lower category, grossing under $10,000. Probably most of us um, are in the next bracket, the 33% that are earning somewhere between ten and $100,000, and, and hopefully many of us are, are, are bumping up beyond that amount too. But I think that kind of sets the trend as to where we are from a statistical standpoint, so that you take 82 and you divide it in half, so you really got 41,000 farms or so in California that are, are significant producers. I thought what I'd do today is just share with you some of the things that we've been uh, developing on Sierra Orchards over the last 30 years is kind of a microcosm of what we're all doing. And hopefully it's reflective of what you all are doing on your farms as well. So here we go. Sierra Orchards and Casey, we've grown a little bit since your last statistic. Yep, we're about 450 acres. Um, nestled uh, in Solano County, and as you'll see at the top of the slide is Yolo County. I've always enjoyed Yolo County because it's such a visionary place with great thinkers, but we're doing a lot in Solano County to catch up. And as you can see at the top of the slide is Pewter Creek, our watershed there. Just to the right, 30 minutes to the right, you can be in Jerry Brown's office with about 2.4 million people in that region. Just to the left, you can be down in Sabella's area uh, in the San Francisco Bay Area with about 7.4 million people. 10 minutes to the south, you can be driving along Route 80 with just 140,000 vehicle passengers a day. So if you think this is a bucolic rural America, I would ask you to think again. And I'd ask you to think what that land is going to look like in 25 years. And I'll tell you, it's going to look exactly the same. Because we sold a conservation easement. <laughs> we sold a conservation easement to the Solano Land Trust. And I'm so glad that John Vasquez is here, one of our great leaders in Solano County. And visionary in the sense, this is what we need to be doing. This is our tax dollars. This is our farmland. And it's what we need to ensure for a sustainable and secure future for, for all of us. So we try to incorporate uh, sustainability into all of our uh, actions, whether it's a production, whether it's conservation or education. I know we're all struggling with what the definition is for sustainability. For me, this is the easiest one. It's a food system that emphasizes a healthy people, a healthy planet, and a healthy profit. And we are always have to be mindful of the last P. If we can't be profitable, you can't be here at this conference, I can't spend the time, we can't send our kids to college, and we just will not produce the type of future that we want and need to. So we're entirely based on an organic system. In walnuts, I know from Karen Klonsky and others that I've got to put 200 pounds of nitrogen per acre each year onto the walnut trees. Trees don't give a darn whether it comes from ammonium sulfate, manures, compost, legumes. So we get half of our load from cover crops, uh, vetches, clovers, magnus peas, etc., and the other from compost. We've moved entirely to a green compost. We put about six tons per acre on. I actually had a lot of farmer complaints when we were using manure-based products, so we've moved away from those. We've gone to no-till operation. We use IPM. This is an outdated picture. We now have puffers um, that we use for mating disruption. And we try to incorporate as many conservation techniques into our program as possible. Uh, solar, which I'll visit in a little bit later, uh, sediment traps for collection of drainage water and sediments, uh, and most importantly, native pollinators. We try to go mainly with buried drip, try to be very cons conservation minded in that area. Uh, in this photo, you'll see on the left a sediment trap. So when you've sent water down a furrow, it gets to the end of the furrow, where does it traditionally go in California? Back into the watershed. And what does it take with it? Everything. It takes the sediment, your fertilizer, your spray, anything of that nature. So if you let the water pond up for a few days, let the sediments drop out, in the dry season you can collect them, put that, your best topsoil back into your field, and then let the water flow into the uh, drainage pond and let it uh, percolate down into your water system. Native bees, don't need to talk to you about native bees, so important globally. If we're going to feed 9 billion people by the year 2050, how are we going to do it? These critters, if we don't have hedgerows and areas for them to habitat, habitat for them, we won't have them. We have really enjoyed um, our work in solar. I, I want to keep doing it. We power up some of our main pumps, our hulling shed for our walnuts. But this, to me, 
is the essence of what I love doing. Um, in our county, we hired a stream keeper several years ago, Rich Maravich, who has been so successful in garnering matching funds for us as farmers to do work on the stream. This is Pewter Creek. What he's told us is that an active fishery needs aeration. It needs shading to cool the waters. If you want to get coho back, that's what you got to do. So what you're looking at is a man-made, woman-made, um, weir, W weir, we brought in off-site boulders, rolled them into the area to create an aerated stream. Um, that wasn't there before. Invasive species, we have spent tens of thousands of dollars removing a rundo on the left there, that fake bamboo, and that's about a four uh, foot wide uh, eucalyptus tree. You can imagine that takes heavy forest equipment to get down there, roadways to remove that. What we're doing with that is narrowing the stream bed. So you can see Pewter Creek here, it's quite wide. We laid those large logs parallel into the stream bed, bulldozed uh, gravel on top of them to narrow the stream, create a faster rushing stream, cooler water, etc. What I've really, really enjoyed is our educational programs. And Miriam Volat and um, is, is Fatima in the crowd today? Fatima Mallet? OK, Fatima. Um, uh, Fatima and Miriam and others have been so involved in the Center for Land-Based Learning. And it's been my passion, one of the things that has fulfilled my life. I think Jared spoke so well to it last night. So we created the Center for Land-Based Learning that Casey mentioned about 14 or 15 years ago. And it's been like a beehive. It's been like an incubator. And it has brought so much joy to us, those people who are mentoring Fatima on our board and Miriam and others, but to the students who we serve. Our goal is to really help the next generation of decision makers who aren't at these tables to be informed stewards of the environment so that when they become community leaders, they know how to vote. I'm not telling them to go organic. I'm not telling them to grow walnuts. But we're giving them the hands-on science-based education to be informed stewards to guide our state. And God knows we need that. You may recognize one gentleman in the middle of that photograph, Masamoto. We do put on a lot of seminars, retreats, workshops um, at our center. And that's Mas doing one on, uh, it's a literature workshop. We hope he comes back and does that. We do a lot of uh, outreach with our UC Davis at Berkeley, as well as community colleges. We serve as a one-stop shop. You can bring a class out, and basically we can do farm management to ecology, to water, um, a lot of uh, uh, pollinators, etc. And I just want to introduce Toby there in the hat, because you'll be seeing <clears throat> a little bit of his operation <clears throat> in this next photograph. <clears throat> 